Let me tell you why and how I became a crime writer. I know I've told parts of this story before, but I only myself have realized very recently what this means to what I've been saying to you over these last few weeks and what I've been saying to myself and the work I've been doing on the Cameron Winter novels, including this new one, The House of Love and Death. Uh, as I started to come to manhood, you know, 14 or 15, I looked around me and I found that I had very few role models in my life that I wanted to emulate, very few ways to learn how to be a man. And the nearest place I found that men I admired were in novels and in movies. The men I admired were tough guys. They were hard men who spoke very bluntly and told the truth in gruff-sounding voices without any kind of soft soap. And I found these men in novels by Ernest Hemingway and tough guy detective stories by guys like Dashiell Hammett and Mickey Spillane and Raymond Chandler. And I saw them on the screen played by actors like Humphrey Bogart and John Wayne. But after a while, I began to notice something about some of these tough guys or some of the tough guy characters that the actors played, that even though their appearance and presentation was incredibly cool and appealing to me, a way I wanted to act, Sometimes their philosophy, the philosophy they represented, and their actual behavior was not all that admirable. And a perfect example is my favorite movie. And it's my favorite movie because it is the best movie ever made, uh, which is Casablanca. And anyone who says it's something else, especially if they say it's Citizen Kane, you know immediately that they're a poser because no one on earth has ever enjoyed Citizen Kane more than Casablanca. There must be another dozen films that come before it. In fact, I would say a lot more than that. But there's only one best movie, and it's Casablanca. And for those of you who bizarrely have never seen it, Humphrey Bogart plays a guy who runs a cafe in Casablanca during World War II before the Americans have gotten into it. Uh, the Casablanca at that point is run by the Vichy French, who are the French who have been conquered by and are collaborating with the Nazis. And Bogart is there because he's had his heart broken when the lady played by Ingrid Bergman left him for her husband, who was a resistance fighter. So Bogart now is, is just absolutely out of everything. He cynically stays out of all of politics until the beautiful Ingrid Bergman shows up with her husband in his cafe in Casablanca. His reaction is one of the most famous, it must be one of the five or ten most famous scenes in all of movies. Here's just a little bit of it, cut one. Of all the gin joints in all the towns in all the world, she walks into mine. What's that you're playing? Oh, just a little something on my own. Oh, stop it. You know what I want to hear. No, I don't. You played it for her, you played it for me. Well, I don't think I can remember. If she can stand it, I can. Play it. Yes, boss. That's uh, where we get the phrase, play it again, Sam, which he never says. But no one is cooler than Humphrey Bogart. No one has ever been cooler or will ever be cooler than Humphrey Bogart. No one was more beautiful than Ingrid Bergman. Nothing's more romantic than a love story set in a war zone. But when I really thought about this as a kid, I'm a kid looking for men to admire, I thought, you know, Bogart isn't really very tough in this story. His girlfriend dumped him, and because his girlfriend dumped him, he's refusing to fight in World War II. I mean, it's Ingrid Bergman, I get that, but it's World War II. I mean, in the end, a woman is only a woman, but how often do you get a chance to kill actual Nazis, right? It doesn't come along that often. I wanted a hero who was tougher than that. I wanted a hero who didn't just look cool and talk tough, who was actually a tough guy. And once I began to consider the actual actions and philosophies of a lot of the tough guys I admired, uh, Mike Hammer in the Mickey Spillane novels and Sam Spade in the Maltese Falcon, I began to look beyond the way they sounded and behaved, which was cool and tough, to what they actually thought and did. You know, when I dismiss a guy like Andrew Tate and people write to me and say, no, Tate is good, it's not that I don't understand Andrew Tate's appeal. I do, but I can't break this habit of looking beyond the sound and appearance of people to their underlying behavior and philosophy to see if they are really tough, if they are really doing something with their life that is tough to do. And for me, I found the perfect mix of tough attitude and righteous action in Philip Marlowe, the hero of Raymond Chandler's tough guy detective stories. That's what made me 
a mystery writer. I turned into a mystery writer. I was fated to become a mystery writer when I read the opening of Chandler's first novel, The Big Sleep. In the opening, Marlowe walks up to the mansion of his rich client, and I'll read you just a little passage from this. I'll try to read it in a, a tough voice. He says, Over the entrance doors, which would have let in a troop of Indian elephants, there was a broad stained glass panel showing a knight in dark ar- armor rescuing a lady who was tied to a tree and didn't have any clothes on, but some very long and convenient hair. The knight had pushed the visor of his helmet back to be sociable, and he was fiddling with the knots on the ropes that tied the lady to the tree and not getting anywhere. I stood there and thought that if I lived in the house, I would sooner or later have to climb up there and help him. He didn't seem to be really trying. See, Marlowe is a shabby working stiff. He's a private detective. He doesn't make a lot of money. But on the inside, he's a knight in shining shining armor. He lives in a grimy and corrupt modern Los Angeles, but he carries inside himself the best ideal of manhood that his culture created, which is the ideal of chivalry. Chandler uh, wrote an essay about Philip Marlowe in which he said, Down these mean streets a man must go who is not himself mean, who is neither tarnished, nor afraid. He has to move. That's where we get the phrase mean streets. He has to move through meanness and corruption and smallness and evil. But inside himself, he has to keep that ideal of manhood alive, of noble manhood alive. That is tough. Now, here's the important point, all right? What we're dealing with now is the end of the modern era. We've had modernism, we've had postmodernism, post-postmodernism. We're coming to an end of that era. The modern era is said to begin with the novel Don Quixote. Some people say that's the first modern novel. And it's the modern novel because it is a satire on the ideas that are present in society. It's a novel about novels. Don Quixote is a guy who's read so many novels about knights that he believes he is living in a knight King Arthur type story, right? And he makes a fool of himself by acting like a knight in a world where knighthood is a fantasy. He thinks windmills are dragons that he has to fight with his lance. He thinks prostitutes are high-born ladies that he should treat, you know, from afar. He should love chastely. He's nuts, right? Now, Philip Marlowe makes himself a hero by doing almost the same thing, by acting like a knight in a world where knighthood is a fantasy. The difference between Don Quixote and Philip Marlowe is the difference between ideology and ideal. Don Quixote is lost in a dream of of chivalry, and he wants the world to play along. He thinks the world is the world of knighthood, and he is a knight in a knightly world. Marlowe doesn't think that at all. He knows the world is crap. He knows it's corrupt. He knows it's evil and wicked. And he knows he's going to get the crap kicked out of him for acting like a knight. And he decides to do it anyway. He's a realist who has decided to live his ideal self as much as possible. And he completely understands the consequences. And that was the man that I wanted to be. I wanted to say, screw modernity, screw feminism. This is why I didn't fight feminism. I never fought feminism. I just ignored it. I just ignored it in my life. I ignored it in other people. I treated women like ladies. I opened doors even when women screamed at me. I didn't react to it. I just ignored it. I ignored the corruption. I just was who I wanted to be. I wanted to be very clear-headed about the world and yet behave as I thought a man should behave, even if it meant getting the crap kicked out of me, which metaphorically speaking, it sometimes did. I sometimes got the crap well and truly kicked out of me in terms of my career, in terms of my finances, sometimes in terms of my face. Time being what it is, I have now reached what is inevitably the final stage of my career. And when you come to the last road, the fi- the, the the final road of your career. You want to use your sharpened talent, which theoretically should be at its height, and you want to make a final statement about what you've learned. I invented the novels that I'm writing now, and again, I've only sort of fully realized this recently. These Cameron Winter novels, and the new one, Please Go By, The House of Love and Death, he is a man, Cameron Winter is a man who has seen and experienced and been part of the worst of modern history, but he's decided to become a poetry professor as the Republic is falling down around him. That's the setting of the stories. The Republic is collapsing, but he has committed himself 
to the old Western values. In his mind, in his heart, it is always around 1800. He knows those values are not going to help him live well. He knows those values are going to cost him, but he has decided to embody them despite the fact it leads to the cross because Philip Marlowe is doing a Christly thing. He is acting in such a way that will get him crucified, and so in some ways is Cameron Winter. We are living in a country that is far more corrupt than Chandler's Los Angeles ever was. I'm writing these novels. I am writing these novels to explain to myself and to you what it means to be a good man in a time of crisis, in a time of collapse, and in a time of evil. And here's why I think it matters that I'm doing this. You have to notice something, that as evil is rising, as abortion uh, goes from safe, legal, and rare rare to shout your abortion and commit it after the baby is born, when our universities are justifying the ugliest violence as long as it's against Jews and the Jew hatred is everywhere, the hatred of womanhood is everywhere, the butchery of children, all of the sick sexual stuff, there's something else that's going on. Art has died. The reason art has died at the same time as evil is rising, is that art is the opposite of ideology. This is why conservatives don't like it either. Art will not do what you want it to do. Art is like life. Art is a reflection of life. It is an illumination of life as lived by human beings. That's why they have to keep editing and and censoring James Bond and P.G. Woodhouse and all these great writers, Agatha Christie. They have to censor them because art just gives you life in its moment. It's an experience. Art is an experience. You don't read to be lectured at. I don't write novels to lecture at you. I write novels to explore life, to show you life as one person with skill and talent who has worked hard to hone his talent can conceive it and can, can communicate it. The living experience is the important thing. Each true interpretation of life, there are many different true interpretations, sometimes clashing true interpretations of life, but each one of them gets you closer to the full experience, and each false experience takes you into a dream world where ultimately good is bad and right is wrong and evil is, you know, is, and evil is moral. Ideology narrows the focus of the mind so that it can, can't see life in all its confusing variety. It's a form of idolatry. I, it's, ideology is a way of taking your ideas and making idols out of them so that they replace the reality, just like a statue replaces God. You know, I had lunch the other day with a, uh, a guy, a French philosopher named Pascal uh, Bruckner, He had an article recently in City Journal called The Conquest of Art, saying that ideology was triumphing over art, that art was being censored in the name of ideology. And here's what he said. He said, just what uh, characterizes, what characterizes an artistic creation, a painting, a symphony, or a novel? These are inventions. They probe into the unknown of symbols, colors, sounds. They celebrate the beauty of the world. They question overturn, console, or blast open. On the other hand, a political doctrine or religious or moral dogma is by nature fixed and tends to assume control over whatever challenges it, anything it challenges its preeminence. Idolatry, ideology forbids as much as it obligates. Sectarian thinkers love neither artistic peaks nor originality, only the drabness of the docile herd. Ideology and art are in opposition to one another, and you cannot create art when ideology uh, or idolatry, because it's the same thing, is triumphant. Here's another quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I used this in a speech not long ago. To do evil, a human being must first of all believe that what he's doing is good, or else that it's a well-considered concerned, act in conformity with natural law. Fortunately, it is in the nature of the human being to seek a justification for his actions. Ideology, that is what gives the evil doing its long sought justification and gives the evil doer the necessary steadfastness and determination. I'm evil because I'm bringing equity. I'm evil because I'm freeing Palestine. I'm evil because I'm decolonizing the world. Uh, so it's good. So the evil is good. Ideas become ideology when we detach them from life, when we try to dominate life with our ideas. Art brings us back to life. If it's great art, it will bring us back to seeing life. And that makes you Philip Marlowe instead of Stalin or Rashida Tlaib. You have to 
you know, you have an ideal of what a man should be, of what a person should be, of what a nation should be, where all men are created equal, where all men are treated the same. You have an ideal of that, but you understand that you are coming to a world where all men are not created equal, where all men are not treated the same, where wealth talks, money talks. You understand that. You understand you're fighting against that or in dialogue with the real world. You believe in chivalry, but you know the world is not a place for knights. You believe in Christ, but you have to be willing to take up the cross because that's the way people reacted to Christ. Or, you know, take up the cross or get demonetized on YouTube, whatever comes first. You're in an interchange with truth, which is why lies are so destructive and why art leads people into a living interchange with reality. It's the, it's the antidote to idolatry. It's no coincidence that culture has come to a halt and evil is rising at the same time. Ideology is idolatry. Life, l'chaim, is the word of God, is the creation of God, which is far vaster than any idea we have can comprehend. So we've reached the ground floor of the modern idea. I've been saying this again for over a year now. We have reached the ground floor of the modern idea, that idea that there might be no God and everything is a construct. It's time to ask ourselves old questions in new ways. God, that guy is great. I love him. If you want more, like and subscribe, and subscribe to The Andrew Clavin Show wherever you get your podcasts.